What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Dream Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, episode six, man, of the X-Men. I've seen it about three times now. Brian. Oh, wow. The reason why, Brian, there's a lot of uh, conversation there. There's a lot of uh, hidden agendas, and, 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 and it's interesting to listen to the back and forth because this show, in both aspects with regards to Professor X's storyline and Storm's storyline, which was another conversation, Brian. Yeah. They do a good job, Brian, of keeping you in this moment. Because after watching episode five, you thought, okay, let me see what's gonna happen next. You weren't thinking about it only until that moment, right? What were your thoughts about uh, episode six, Brian? And then we'll get into some more broader discussions when we get to the live action version of the X-Men, which we've touched upon in other episodes, but we want to further get into it to sort of uh, listen to the perspective of the possible scenarios, Brian, that could uh, come up from this iteration of the X-Men that we're seeing now on Disney Plus, Brian. Well, I think this show continues to be very smart in its pacing and its cutting in the sense of when you where we left episode five, I almost think it would have been a mistake to try and really pick up right then and there. Like it was just so intense and kind of so emotional. And so similar to a multi-pronged story, you cut away, you cut away and you kind of take a breath, but you you then hit us with new material in, in other ways with other characters. I mean, honestly, the longest unanswered question from the original X-Men show is the fate of Charles Xavier. Um, when, when sort of he, as I said, he exists and he goes off with the Shi'ar, but I think we've waited for years to know what what exactly that looked like. So and how best gets the to do it than it. just to give us in this episode to make us forget about everything else. Exactly. Really? It, it is the perfect counterpoint to be like, you just you just had your heart ripped out by the by the gambit rogue magneto genosha sequence and then it's like oh yeah there was this other huge elephant in the room question from years ago yeah. and so we just kind of get into it but i thought this episode really started to ask at least in my mind bigger picture questions beyond just this show uh, as it pertains to the arrival of mutants in the MCU and so that's you know that's kind of the tie in that i want to do this week um, and certainly we appreciate everyone who t- who's been, you know, having a dialogue about our episode five conversation. I'm glad people that, that hit a nerve with people. And it seems like people you know, love the episode and want to talk about it, which is great. Um, but this is a different episode. What I guess my question for you, first off, is what did you think about the creative decision to not really give you any backstory to Charles Xavier's trans like from the end of the show it really was just sort of like hey we're now with the Shi'ar here's Professor X here's Lalandra here's what's going on off we go like what what did you think about that decision versus like really trying to re-educate people on sort of where we left the original series Brian I think the way they began it because everybody, everybody who saw the last episode, because not many people saw the last episode of uh, season five of X-Men. Not many people remember it because it was about that time that the animation was sort of falling off. Uh, I don't know. It was still interesting to me, but the animation wasn't as, uh, uh, it was different. So it was. So I guess it put some people off, and and people just forgot about it. So for those people who do know, like myself, and perhaps you, Brian, if you saw that episode, this was perfect in that we know that he went off to the Shi'ar to get healed by their tech. Clearly, that's happened, and there is this thing between them that is undeniable. Right? So she's taking care of him and you're seeing that. And now we're arriving at this point of a decision. He spent enough time there. All that, Brian, just to know what he's doing, just 
I think it was, again, brilliant in that respect that I did not think not once about what had just happened. And this is, the, I guess, the perfect bridge. But I think it's I think it's an interesting creative choice because I think if you think about other TV shows, animated or live action or movies, when you have a, a hero like Charles Xavier who is near death and then they kind of get this second lease on life, most of the time I feel like creators choose to show you the rehabilitation process, right? Like I'll give you a few humorous examples. Like think about like Tom Cruise in Last Samurai. Think about Steven Seagal, like hard to kill, right? Like they like showing you the, the restoration montage. Of course. This show basically said, you know, it happened. So we just going to go right to the part. We're going to cut to the chick, right to the part that matters yes. of this fulcrum moment of Charles Xavier's crossroads in, in life to choose his life on earth or to choose this new life here with the Shi'ar. I just thought that was interesting. I was not expecting that necessarily. And I think a lot of shows might have spent time and you could argue wasted time in episodes one through five with cutaways yeah. to Professor X with the Shi'ar getting his body back and getting his mind right. Like we didn't get any of that. They just went right to sort of this clim seemingly climactic choice, which I just think is interesting. I, I, think, I think it's right. Like I, after I saw it, I was like, that was a good decision, but it's not necessarily one I would expect. And Storm's probably will get to that. But yeah. Brian, I want to ask you this. They've created an ideology that exists within Professor Xavier and that now exists or is starting to manifest, manifest within uh, Scott. What do you think that reunion will be, that conversation would be because Scott seems to have lost almost or beginning to, again, lose his way in believing in that dream that Xavier has created his X-Men for, right? Well, I think actually you get a clue as to one of the classic mistakes that Professor X is going to fall into, which is when he sort of has this nostalgic remembrance of Magneto in conversation. And it just, I think it, that little bit is there to let you know that Professor X only remembers the X-Men and the, that world exactly how he left it. We know, dramatic irony, a lot has changed <laughs> while he was away. And so I think already you're setting up one of those classic sort of fish out of water or like, what the happened while I was gone. And and I think Scott is a big example of that. I think Magneto is a big example of that. Certainly like, you know, so right those there, relationships Brian. again are already going to be on different have to be frequencies. They have to be reestablished. And, and the there's be a lot of biases because Professor X is going to be like, wait, you used to be this or you used to be that. And they're going to be like, where were you Ooh, when we needed man. you in this period? And you, and you know what? They gave us a little bit of insight into Professor X's game. He, he talked that, yo, you know what I'm saying? He, he, his game is, is tight, you know what I'm saying? And, and But Rolando was not, you know, you've met your match, sort of, sort of uh, that the back and forth was really quite uh, well done. But Brian, he will seemingly return to a Magneto whom he possibly remembers as still a friend, but that also, Brian, is going to be, be a very interesting conversation man oh my goodness one comment which was just I was this is what i love about the show's almost wink wink type things is when they put him in the classroom <laughs> i thought that was hilarious he, he's like wait i know what i'm good at and then they actually draw it as they've got like gladiator all these guys are just sitting at a <laughs> desk taking notes and i was like see that's where this show kind of key it gets dark in places but it remembers what it is yeah. and so I, I actually really love just that they threw that in there it's like yeah he is still professor x yeah. unless you forgot <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it crossed your mind, but it definitely crossed mine. If he would only get out of his own way, Brian. Oh, this is always the case though, right? With the character. If The Rock would only get out of his own way, he'd be perfect as Gladiator. Cause no one seemingly can beat this guy, right? 
<laughs> they the can like sort it. of stop him momentarily, but he is super powerful. But if only Gorok would get out of his own way, would he be able to play that character? Because Gladiator is dope. He's really cool in small doses. Yes. Because yes. he suffers a little bit. He He's like Superman without the personality in some ways. And so it, there is that boredom factor of like, if you just constantly go to that well. But when he first popped up on screen, I had that moment of like, oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot how badass <laughs> this guy actually is in a fight, you know, in the yeah. way they use him and draw him. So yeah, yeah and like those little bit like call to the bullpen. Yeah, it works perfectly uh, in this episode. He's like... Uh... Um, Josh Brolin's a character in Dune. He's just a soldier. He's 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 loyal to the throne. And you yeah. know, Brian, I don't know if you know this, but that dude with the that looked like he had some fire and stuff. Okay. You, do you know who that is? No. That is, I believe his name is Vulcan. I'm not. I, I, oh, the third Summers brother. Yes. Yes, I did know. I did know. That. I did remember. Sorry, I did remember this. Yeah. At some point, yo, this is why this X Men thing can go on forever, and I'll be happy, yo. This dude at, at some point becomes the emperor, yo. He becomes ruler at one at some point, and they. Oh man, this why I'd... you're jogging my memory because I did have this in my notes originally. This character's presence. I don't know if they'll pull on this strand in mm-hmm. in this season. But he's like the latest, kind of like Gene. He's kind of like the latest prime evidence that like, yeah, Professor X is virtuous, but he kind of, with with that mind stuff, he kind of mind Fs a lot of families and a lot of people, right? Because you've got like Scott Havoc and then you got this guy. And it's like, if you like how they link that in the comics and the awareness and sort of the, the, the deception around it, it's... It's one more thing where you're like, yeah, I get that Xavier's intentions are noble, but man, he kind of strays off the course and does some shady stuff along the way to, to kind of achieve what he wants. Storm, Brian, the second part of her story in this. What did you think of it, Brian? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll have my final thoughts on it. Well, I kind of like that they've, give, again, this is similar, a little bit similar to the Scott situation where i think they've taken aurora's character and tried to find an arc where she's in to keep her interesting i think choosing her to be the one who who loses her powers and then has to go on this sort of almost spiritual journey uh to regain them in a somewhat different form i thought was actually a good choice i kind of have enjoyed that she's off doing something else because you knew when she lost her powers that early in the show you're like all right well she's gonna get them back but let's see how we achieve that and so I've kind of liked that she has had this dynamic arc now uh, off with Forge and off by herself. So now that makes her a little more interesting when we reintegrate her with the team, presumably, and 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 whatever role she's going to play post the Genosha attack. So I've been pretty happy that there was a storyline for her that felt like it had some movement to it. Yeah. All I would have to say to this, to, to, to this storyline for her, I have a daughter. I've asked my daughter, watch the X-Men, yo. Because a lot of the themes regarding herself, Brian, apply to many of us in some capacity. Some stronger than others. And that, to me, Brian, was a powerful episode that many uh, young ladies should be should watch should watch is what i'd say there's a little bit of you know this is a in a mini mini light version of almost a little phoenix-esque kind yes. of feel to it and i like it i like that it's yeah. done this way I, I like that the phoenix is off somewhere in the bag and we're not touching it yeah. and we're playing around with storm as a vehicle for this but i agree like i said i this show is so far and i have to <clears throat> think we're hearing they might go beyond season two but i do think the fact Better. that they wrote to see a two season arc almost similar to loki means that when i see these little subplots playing out i know that there is destination for them if that makes sense the writers knew there was initial destination when they put these in there in the first place so that i'm very in, i'm very locked in on all of these in part because i know that 
In the future, Brian, Wolverine and Storm are together. Yep. After Wolverine sees Storm now, he might get that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's going to be like, Storm. <laughs> like, Gene, go get your boy. <laughs> Double date. <laughs> Word up. Uh, but, but, Brian, we've touched on it again. The reality with regards to the MCU's turn on presenting a live action X-Men, Brian. We're sort of getting a bridge towards the future, possibly, Brian, with Secret Wars being the, the event that starts it all over again, right? How are you feeling going into Deadpool, having seen something like this and just continues to get better and better, Brian. Well, how you how you going? Uh, how you going about thinking about going into seeing that? Well, I think this goes back to this is a, we've had this discussion before the show came out, given the timing, and you raised the question in our last show, and I'm going to raise it again after this episode six, which is, I think this show is making it almost impossible for Disney and Marvel to totally separate what they do in live action because the show is so good. <clears throat> and I, there seem to be a few nuggets in this show that might indicate that Disney's and Mar and Kevin Feige are aware of that. Um, there was like, there's just a few things like you mentioned last week, the watchers cameo. I noted this week, the choice that like have Ronan appear, have the Cree appear, the way they're depicting some of these characters. It, Yes, it's 97, the show, but it does have that. There's some timeless stuff in here. There's some modern stuff in here that almost feels like it could be paving the way for similar depictions in the actual live action characters. Um, and I I hope that's the case. I mean, I this is a great template. You can't do it exactly, obviously, but I, I think some of these characters, if you were to go in a very different direction in terms of portrayal and look than what we're getting in this show, I think fans would have a much bigger problem with that now than they did in 1999. You know, it's interesting. I saw in our in our episode five uh, show, there were a couple of comments debating the merits of those movies. And for me, those movies are very much in the time capsule. Like if you watch them today, they age poorly, in my opinion. Which ones though? X-Men, X X2. The, the two Brian singers, forget Last Stand, I just yeah, I, I yeah, ignore yeah, that. Yeah, that never yeah, happened. Yeah. But like the first two. Yeah, 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 yeah. To me, at the time, given where the bar was, coming off of Batman and Robin and then Blade, I thought they were largely successful, if not faithful, to the animated show. Mm -hmm. Were those exact movies to be released today? Oh, we would be disappointed. I think have, I'll, I'll have my bag of tomatoes we, ready. Yes, correct. That's so. That's what I mean by like the time matters. And so I feel like now with this show doing what it's doing, but now we have all of this superhero legacy that's out there due to Endgame and all the stuff that's been good. Honestly, forget the fatigue. All the stuff that's been good over the last twenty years. I think the bar is so much higher for what they're attempting to do next. That my biggest wish for Deadpool is simple. Great. I don't know why we needed a swan song for all these characters, but it better be the swan song for all these characters. Yes. I mean, Wolverine will still be a part of Secret Wars, Brian. So it'll be after that. What will be what will it be after that? That's my expectation. Well, that's you're, fine. If they want to get this, yeah. I'll let you I get have what you're this. saying. You know what I'm I saying? I get what you're saying. So then I guess I would say. Whatever, whatever arc Deadpool and Wolverine opens has to be closed definitively in Secret Wars. And I don't want to ever revisit the 20th Century Fox verse again. I'm good. More than good. Yeah, that should be done. It should be done. It should be done. Yeah. 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 Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think. 
of episode six? Did it, did, did, were your minds erased of the events of the previous episode? And did you enjoy that episode? I, I really enjoyed it because because I like the, the the conversation, Brian. The con- the dialogue to me is 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 the best part of all this because there's consequences to what is being said. And and Gambit's death takes on additional meaning with the telepathic impact, right? Like immediately the writers you that's the one. We, as I said, we cut away from that scene. We didn't go back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you got this like, in case you forgot, we killed one of your most beloved characters last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, he's going to be in part the catalyst for Professor X remembering who he is. Yeah. Smart. For some reason, it almost remind me of this movie uh, Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and uh, Jane Seymour. He hit wow, me. that's a reference. That's, you, look at you. You remember that? I don't know. I've not seen this movie. Wow, check it out. But I'll tell, okay. but I'll tell you... Uh, it's, Damn, it's a spoiler. Forget it. I won't say anything. I okay. Won't say it. I won't say it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. But uh, yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of how are you going into watching Deadpool? Are you going into thinking this is going to be uh not necessarily. Nobody's. I don't think anyone is, is thinking this is going to be a continuation of what's going on in the show or that sort of feel or that drama. This is more of a show and entertain, you know, this is entertaining as a spectacle circus, what I call it. Uh, and, and that is all I am expecting it to be based on the trailers that you've seen. I'm telling you, Brian, if I see some of those same jokes in the movies that we've seen in the trailers, Brian, I'm going to be very disappointed. Yeah, they're not going to have the same impact now. That's the other thing. They've used a lot of Yeah, it's going to be a lot of silence. But we'll see. Let us know in the comments below uh, what you guys think, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Report. The show goes on!